in life, many of us start out in a box of low expectations. And our boxes may go by many different names. Mine's was called the ghetto, the hood. Yours may be called the barrio, the slum, the trap, the suburb. Whatever it is, although we tend to think of it in terms of some geography, it's not restricted by that. It's about the expectations that one has about what's possible and what's not for those born in the box. Now, we often think of boxes in terms of what they lack, such as access or opportunity. But there are some boxes that are defined by things that most people actually want. Wealth, power, privilege. Some people are born into those boxes. But all the same, it's, it establishes a status quo that many of us will spend much of our lives trying to escape. Let me tell you a little bit about my box. After surviving physical and sexual abuse, I was surrendered to foster care. Just another poor, poor black kid growing up in America. I still remember growing up in Compton and often seeing young black men leaned over police cruisers with their arms handcuffed behind their back. I still remember growing up and living through the LA riots and cautiously riding down the street with my father as we watched my favorite movie rental store go up in flames. Now, of course, I had plenty of good memories, too. I remember frequently visiting the Compton Library. I remember going to church. I remember winning my first race at a track meet. And oh, I remember enjoying a fresh, hot bag of fries from the local Tams. <laughs> but I always felt like I was growing up in a box. And it's one that I so desperately wanted to get out of. So I turned to the world of tech. And after teaching myself how to code when I was eight years old, with the insistence of my parents, I went off to college and I earned a degree in computer science. I would later go on to work for Google as a software engineer for eight years, building things used by people all over the world. Now, if you think that it's pretty simple for me to just get out of my box, let me challenge that notion with some data. By the time a foster kid turns 21, one in four will have experienced homelessness and one in five will have been incarcerated at least once. Of the over 22,000 foster kids who age out of the system every year, only about 3% of them will go on to earn a four-year degree. And if you're like me, Black and wanting to get into tech to be something like a software engineer, the data is even more challenging. Although the U.S. population is 15% Black, only 5% of software engineers are Black. And the number of Black computer science graduates over the past several years has actually been on the decline, sitting somewhere around 4.2%. I've reflected a lot on this, and there's one question that keeps coming to the forefront of my mind. And it's a question that I'd like to attempt to answer here over the next few moments. Why did I make it out? And how do we help others do the same? I've thought about this a lot over the years, and I think that the answer lies with my foster parents. So what is it really that they did to put me on this path that would propel me out of my box and into a world where I would defy the odds and become the man that I am today. Well, whether they know it or not, I believe that there are three principles that they taught me that radically redefined my life and granted me this opportunity, not just to see escaping the box as a possibility, but as an inevitability. And I'd like to share these three principles with you in the hope that they will help you to get out of your box. Here's the first principle. Adversity has its advantages. Now, we don't like trauma because it's painful. Trauma and adversity are things that, by definition, carry these long-term adverse consequences that we bring with us throughout the years of our life. And by the time I was seven years old, I had already survived more than my fair share of trauma. But I remember something that my mother taught me when I was young. 
And I, I can't have been older than six years old when she first told this to me. She looked at me and she said, Anthony, you can be like these other kids who have lost their parents and have been surrendered to the foster care system. You can run the streets, you can join a gang, and honestly, nobody will blame you. Or you can choose by God's power to live a completely different life, to break the cycle of abandonment in our community and to show the world that you don't have to be defined by your circumstances. To my parents, trauma was an opportunity for me to live in a way that was different than the way most people did. I just had to choose what I wanted to do with my life. And it turns out that my parents were attempting to develop something in me that scientific research would later explicitly name just a few years later as post-traumatic growth, or PTG. Now, you can think of this as the opposite response to something that we call today post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Here's how professors of psychology, Richard Tedeschi and Lawrence Calhoun, defined post-traumatic growth in their 2004 paper, and I quote, post-traumatic growth defines the experience of individuals whose development, at least in some areas, has surpassed what was present before the struggle with trauma occurred. The individual has not only survived, but they have experienced changes that are viewed as important and that go beyond what was the previous status quo. Post-traumatic growth is not about a return to baseline. It's an experience of development and of improvement that for some persons is deeply profound." End quote. Interestingly, in that same paper, Tedeschi and Calhoun acknowledged this idea that suffering and despair serving as the foundation for positive change is an idea, quote, thousands of years old, unquote. But my parents already knew that. They knew that without having done any research at all. They knew that because they read the Bible. See, they believe, as I believe, that the resurrection of Christ following the most traumatic event in all of human history, as represented by his death and burial, serves as an enduring foundation of hope upon which millions of millions have believed over centuries. They were familiar with the narratives of folks like Paul, who, while sitting in the middle of a Roman prison, suffering what we would call today human rights abuses, rights of joy, and the ability to find contentment in any situation. They taught me about James, another Bible writer who writes, count it all joy when you suffer trials of various kinds. My parents had given me this framework in the Bible that allowed me to see my trauma not as some death stroke to which I should eventually succumb, but as an opportunity to live according to a completely different status quo. So not only did my parents teach me about the advantages of adversity, but there's another principle that they taught me. You can always change more about your environment than you think you can. Now, even though I knew I was growing up in the hood, it didn't always feel like I was growing up in the hood. Even though I knew we were poor, it didn't always feel like we were poor. My parents even made sure that my education was different. And, and I'll give you an example. Unlike the Compton Unified School District of today, back in the early 90s, things had gotten so bad that the state of California actually took it over. And me being in public school at the time, my parents were very concerned that my chances of making it to college might be jeopardized by a failing educational system. So just imagine with me that Yale University, one of the most prestigious schools in all the world, decided to come to Compton and open up a completely innovative, free, state-of-the-art middle school right here. But that, that sounds like incredible opportunity, right? Well, that's exactly what happened, except it wasn't Yale University. It was the National Football League. Still excited? Well, my parents were, and they pulled me out of public middle school in order to attend this innovative charter school just to provide me a unique educational opportunity. And it went as, about as well as you might expect. I don't remember much about what I learned, but I did play a lot of football, 
And I got to visit Michael Jackson's house at Neverland Ranch. So do with that what you will. <laughs> However, it was at this little school that I learned how to use the internet for the very first time. And that knowledge serves as the foundation for the career in tech that I enjoy today. Now, some people might call me lucky, but my parents were always very intentional about finding opportunities for me just like this and placing me into places of privilege. So not only did my parents teach me about the upsides of trauma, and not only did they teach me about how to own my environment and shape it for the better, but there's one more principle that they gave me. Be a person who takes the right risks and breaks the right rules. Now, obviously, there are some rules that we should never break. Don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery, don't speed, don't drink and drive. Breaking these rules are sure to make you stand out, but not in a good way. But there are these other rules that we're often afraid to break because we fear these hidden consequences. But the people who challenge the status quo by breaking with norms tend to be the people who innovate in ways that other people don't. There's no other place where I've learned this more than in Black history. My mother, I remember her taking me to a Black bookstore in Compton, just about a block away from here. And in that bookstore, I was surrounded by people who looked like me, who had overcome seemingly insurmountable odds, despite the suffering that they faced. And there was one book in particular by a man named Robert C. Hayden entitled Nine African American Inventors that changed my life. My mother would actually make me and my brothers read a chapter out loud to each other every morning before school. And in that book, I learned about people like Garrett A. Morgan, who invented a precursor to the modern traffic light. I learned about Louis Latimer, who invented a better filament for Thomas Edison's light bulb. I became acquainted with Frederick McKinley Jones, who invented mobile refrigeration, without which we wouldn't have ice cream trucks, feel me? And I got to meet the real Elijah McCoy, the, the real McCoy. He, he invented a better lubrication system for steam engines. All of these black men, some of them who were former slaves and others who were the children of slaves, and still others who had been victimized and traumatized by Jim Crow discrimination, they all broke the rules that said that a black man couldn't be smart, and couldn't become a world-changing innovator. And because of their example, I became a technologist, an innovator, and an advocate for underrepresented people in tech, lighting the way for the next generation of technologists. So all of these lessons, learning to see the advantages of adversity, being taught how to shape my environment for the better, and being a risk taker, who breaks the right rules, these are all lessons that I carry with me to this day. And whether you're from the hood like me, or whether you're from places of power and privilege, I invite you to change the status quo of what it means to come from where you come from. And let's not let trauma define who we are and determine where we choose to go. Thank you.